it's noon. So welcome, everybody. I see many people connected to this uh, webinar. So thanks uh, for joining us. And so welcome uh, to this uh, second webinar of the seminar series in value creation organized by the AIM Research Center on Artificial Intelligence in Value Creation. So this uh, second seminar will be focused on uh, the, the inspection, a holistic and analytic process to assess ethical AI. Um, I want to, uh, before introducing our uh, speaker today, and thanks uh, Roberto for joining uh, with this uh, important guest speech. I just uh, spend a few words uh, about uh, uh, the Research Center and the calendar of the seminar series. Uh, so the Research Center on Artificial Intelligence in Value Creation has been launched uh, in 2018. And so we are at the third year of activity and uh, we are really addressing uh, how artificial intelligence uh, creates value. Uh, value is business value, but it could be also societal value. And uh, today we'll address one of the most important value component, which is the ethical value. So thanks Roberto Zicari for joining uh, with this webinar, because uh, the goal uh, of this uh, seminar is uh, to open the debate, uh, to open the, the reflection and the research around uh, the main topic related to artificial intelligence. I remind that uh, this uh, webinar is the second of uh, a calendar of a seminar series that we are organizing uh, this year in the research center. And so for each month, uh, we invite uh, a top scholar or a leading scholar uh, who is contributing in the academic community from a multidisciplinary uh, perspective uh, to the debate around artificial intelligence, uh, around the free access of value creation, which are business value, societal value, and ethical value, uh, to contribute uh, sharing uh, the research, uh, sharing uh, the insights, uh, opening the debate. And the goal is really to generate uh, creative ideas, uh, collaboration network uh, in the academic community, but also open up uh, the, the debate uh, around the main topic uh, that uh, surround us. Uh, we had uh, last month uh, the first webinar with Frederick Moisan and today uh, Roberto Zicari. Uh, you see here that uh, for each month uh, we have um, a guest speaker, an important guest speaker, touching uh, regulation, touching uh, uh, business impact uh, with smart products in the B2B, or uh, looking at the sociology of AI. So you see the topic are very attractive and interesting. And uh, uh, from now till uh, January, the, the seminar will be online in the webinar uh, mode. But then starting from February, we hope uh, to um, have uh, again uh, the seminar in the campus face-to-face. Uh, -face. Let me introduce uh, today our uh, guest, uh, Roberto Zicari. Uh, Roberto Zicari is a professor of database and information system at Goethe University in Germany. And he is also the founder of the Frankfurt Big Data Lab and the editor of the ODM BMS org, which is a web portal and also ODM BMS industry watch blog. And personally, I appreciate a lot Roberto for the critical thinking, for his contribution to the academic community because he organizes a lot of webinar that in particular we share a lot of research, a lot of debates with the other professor and I appreciate a lot, benefited a lot. Uh, around ethics, uh, which is uh, one of the critical uh, topic uh, in, um, in the artificial intelligence today. Uh, I remind also that uh, Roberto Zicari has been in the past five years also visiting professor with the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at Berkeley in US. So thanks Roberto for joining us uh, and uh, I leave you uh, to share your video and to start your webinar. Thank you, Margarita, um, and uh, thank you, everybody. Let me just share my presentation. You should see here. So I'm quite happy to take the opportunity to explain the work we've been doing in the last uh, almost two years. The title is The Inspection Analytic Analytic Process to Assess Ethical AI. As you can see, um, we're going to talk about some of the aspects that Margarita was mentioning, the societal and ethical impact. 
This is not really a work that I did by myself. We have a so-called core team that developed this uh, work. And you can see from this list that, the, uh, especially from the affiliation, we are an interdisciplinary team. The core team is small. You know, the largest team you see is even bigger than that. And you go from computer science to philosophy and, and some people in uh, healthcare because we've been working on some cases in healthcare. The uh, idea here is to consider what kind of impact the use of technology such as AI has on people's life. And so when you look at that, you don't really look at, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, software per se, but you really consider also everything that is around that processes, people, the context. So this is a quote that I think it was quite relevant to understand that when we're really looking at using complex technology, we're really looking at a much more complex environment than simply looking at the software. So what is the status quo? Well, we're talking about ethics, but ethics is always connected to the view of the world. And in our work, we are using contemporary Western European democracy as our view of the world, which is based on fundamental values. And the essence of is done in that space. Of course, you know, if you have a different uh, view of the world, your council of ethics might change. And there's also a challenge. In Germany, in 2018, the uh, federal government has set up a so-called German Data Ethics Commission with the mission to develop within a year ethical and regulatory framework for data, what they call ADM, which is basically AI-based systems. It was co-chaired by uh, two uh, professors um, and they uh, presented their opinion on uh, 23rd of October last year, including ethical guidelines and 75 concrete recommendation for action regarding data and algorithmic systems. What is interesting for us, you know, they focus on data. So the first two parts is data in general, personal data. But the interesting thing was for us to look at what they uh, recommended when you are start using the data. So, because data, if it's not used, it's kind of a silo that is there, but it's not really being used. So it's only with the algorithm, with the software that you use data that you actually transform data into some kind of value. And the ethics of the digital transformation in general, which is very important because you also have to consider the platform where the data ends up being the cloud and, and a few other things. They look at some general ethical principle. They mention human dignity, autonomy, privacy, security, democracy, justice and solidarity and sustainability. Now, these are very good um, principle. To put them into a context, the European Commission independently has been working for the last two years with the so-called high-level expert group. Now, some of you are probably very familiar with that. They started with free ethical principle rooted in fundamental rights, respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, no surprise, there are ethical principle that you find in bioethics. And they added this one here, explicability, to capture the fact that sometimes AI is like a black box that you cannot really look through, but you might want to still explain why certain decisions were made with certain output. And they recognize that tension between this uh, principle. This principle is very difficult to put them into practice, although we're talking about uh, apply ethics. So they come up with the word called trustworthy AI. So where trust is actually the key. 
and they try to define what it means, trustworthy artificial intelligence. And they have three pillars, should be lawful, so respecting all ethical or laws and regulation, which is actually something that is not that complicated, except that some law still have a gap. Ethical, respecting ethical principle and value. This is already more difficult because you need to agree on ethical principle and values and robust, both from a technical perspective while taking account social environment. This is not easy, taking account social environment is not as easy as to fix some technical bugs. They come up with uh, seven requirements in order for an AI to be deemed trustworthy. I read them for you because that's basically what they have. They have one, human agency and oversight, including fundamental rights, and uh, human oversight and agency. So you know, people in the loop, technical robust and safety. And here you really have the, uh, the technical aspects of uh, resilience to attack, security, accuracy, reliability, reproducibility. Privacy and data governance, which has uh, a part on privacy, quality of data, integrity of data, source of data, transparency, which really includes traceability, explainability, and communication, how you communicate. And then you have the last three, diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness, probably the most uh, discussed in nowadays, which obviously includes unfair bias, accessibility, universal design, stakeholder participation. This is not an easy, aspect because it really depends on the level of view you are, if you are at the level of application or the level of the software. And then societal environmental well-being, which is kind of difficult to define. And you see democracy is actually mentioned here. It's very important. And accountability, because in the end, you have also legal aspects of using something, if something goes wrong, especially. In the literature, you sometimes cluster this concept in different areas like together. So this is just, you know, to see other ways of seeing the same uh, concept cluster together. There is a gap. And the gap is all good. You know, the European Commission has come up with uh, a checklist with detailed questions, even a tool to, uh, if you answer the question to put some score. But there is a big gap between having a real case when somebody say, well, I have this AI product or services. Is that good to use it in this context? And, you know, and the answer is, how do I do it? And there is a big gap. And that's exactly what we've been working on by defining a process. We call it Z inspection. It's a registered trademark, but all the work is uh, under common creative. And it's basically taking into account not only the software, but also an holistic perspective. So how this AI is having an impact in the overall system. It can be used by a variety of people, depending on why you want to use it. And to our best knowledge, it's probably one of the first process to assess what the EU call trustworthy AI in practice. So how did we do that? So the question that we start asking ourselves is, how do we know what are the benefits and risk of an AI system? We had no clue. When we started January last year, there was really nothing. And so we said, well, let's learn by just doing things. And we develop our inspection by analyzing a real product, an AI-based medical device for enhancing decision-making cardiology. So this is actually this one here. It was an AI for predicting cardiovascular risk, the project um, we com completed, but the project was actually uh, useful for us in order to learn and define a process that can be then reused for this domain. And now we started to work on this other one, just started, which is basically um, assessing the use of machine learning as a supported tool to recognize cardiac arrest in emergency call. We worked together with um, the uh, emergency center and the uh, medical school in Copenhagen, because that's really based there. And we will assess 
the ethical and legal and technical implication on that. A third best practice that we will work soon, starting in November, will be with the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And this time is using deep learning, so neural network for classifying skin lesion. So if the AI is able to detect skin cancer and help the, um, the uh, doctors to do a better uh, diagnosis. For that, our team is actually larger. So the, the first one was a core team. Now this is a extended team, as you see the number of people. What I think is more relevant for you is to figure it out that this team is really interdisciplinary. And just to give an idea, you really go from philosophy to deep down into machine learning, passing to ethics, healthcare, all kinds of healthcare professional. So I think it's quite a uh, unique uh, opportunity for all of these people to work together on a common goal. And basically the process, if you think about it, since you, you know, it, this is a business school that is hosting the seminar. So I'm, I'm happy for that because it's kind of a due diligence. So I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar. We have done some due diligence in your professional or research life. This is really an orchestration process. So we are not really doing everything ourselves. We are trying to coordinate, set up a team then can really do the investigation to figure it out to what extent this use of AI is trustworthy. And if yes, to which extent. So why this uh, process? It could be uh, useful for many people. It could be useful for stakeholders to make decision, a government level, a public organization, a private uh, organization, is the use of this particular AI in this particular context and domain appropriate? So where you start thinking, okay, appropriate means is that, is that trustworthy? And then if it's trustworthy, then you can still make decision depending on the number of issues. Of course, you know, you can minimize risk because obviously if the AI is doing something that cause harm, there is an accountability in place. It could be also be used for establishing trust in AI because our experience shows that even if the AI is sometimes accurate and is uh, supporting human being, they might not trust it for all kinds of reason. So there is a far more to look at than simply looking at the software. Stakeholders can be a variety of those, designer, field policymakers. And it can be used in various phases. It can be used if you have access to the designer, you can influence the design of the process, or it can be used afterwards when the software has been deployed to monitor it. I like that because this is basically also our mission is to try to define a mindful use of AI. So, which is basically our contribution to do a better job in a better world. A couple of preconditions that are important to consider if you ever want to assess a technology like AI. Wh why you want to do that? Who wants to uh, do it? So the who requests an inspection. At the moment is only a self-assessment, you know, it's not required by law, is recommended by the EU, for example. Why you want to carry in your organization is very important to understand your internal mission. For whom is the inspection relevant? It is recommended required. At the moment it is recommended. It might be that in a couple of years it will be mandatory if there is a certification or, or a law in place. And also what are the sufficient and necessary conditions that you want to analyze within the seven requirements? And also how to use the results in inspection. The different reason for that, because you can verify, you can certify, you can sanction if it's legal. Very important that whoever does an inspection, I think is important that is a neutral effective inspection. There should be no conflict of interest whatsoever between whoever is inspecting and the organization to be examined. And so that means uh, no conflict of interest between inspector and vendors of tool, toolkits, framework, platform. 
in all kinds of other situations that can potentially bias the result. Also, the team should not be biased, which is also an issue, you know, especially if, um, if you have go, then you are good, is a no go if one or three are not satisfied. So I think this is important. I don't mean the self uh, assessment in company is a bad idea. I'm only saying that it is very likely that self assessment done by an organization who has a mission of, of selling some software will eventually bump into tension between the mission of the organization and, and the neutral effectiveness of an assessment. Important is also to understand the result of this assessment, what you do, you share it with the public, you keep it private. If you keep it private, what is the reason? And also IP, intellectual property is playing a role here. It's important to understand that no matter how you want to assess some AI, AI is always embedded into a context, which also includes political institutional aspects. This is very important not to forget. And therefore I'm quoting the, uh, the, the, the German Data Ethics Commission, because you know, from a Western perspective, context, trust and ethics are closely related to democracy. And they recommended that need of examination is the extent to which the function of, in this case, the AI system can affect the function of democracy fundamental rights, secondary law, or the basic rules of the rule of law. Very important. So here is a question that I'm actually sharing with you, might be actually subject of debate. But what if when you are using an AI or you, or you decide deciding to use an AI, the environment where the AI has been designed, deployed and tested does not fulfill our notion of democracy. So what do you do with that? I think this is a question that in our assessment has to be asked. I don't have the answer, but I think it's important to ask the question because if you are not thinking about it, you just don't ask the question. By the way, um, I did a uh, early this year, a uh, presentation at the uh, federal government. They have a, an AI committee there. And I make this recommendation, at least in terms of uh, public um, organization, I recommend it not to use AI, which are designed or implemented in environments where democracy is not in line with what our concept of Western democracy. Of course, it's a debatable point, very actual and it becomes that politicians have to make decision and they should really have some kind of quality to make decision. What is also interesting and that's the experience that we had working on the real case is that um, AI is embedding ethics into the design. For example, when you design, you're, you're a software engineer and, and machine learning engineer, you designing and training your AI system most of these people don't have an education in ethics because that's our education system does not really pretend that. And we end up embedding into the AI system notions such as good, bad, healthy, disease, mostly in a not explicit way. You set the threshold and the device said, well, you seem to be not healthy, but what is the threshold? Who set the threshold? This is very important. It's been studied by experts in this field. And I'm quoting a, a colleague that is in, in this area. He said, in case of medical diagnosis or treatment, recommendations are being deferred to machine learning algorithm. It is the algorithm who sets the bar about how a disease is being defined. Really interesting because then eventually there's an impact on the interaction between the patient, the doctors, the experts. Some, in some cases, there's been um, some suggestion of scoring an AI. I have my own doubts about scoring because an AI is not a fridge. You know, when you buy a fridge and you have a energy 
consumption labels like green, you're good, red, you, know, you don't want to buy that. It's kind of one at a time labeling, but nobody comes in your house three years later to check if your fridge is uh, being consuming the energy that was supposed to do. Something different with, with the cars, if there's a regulation that tells you have to bring car for an inspection for safety reason. So there's a law for that. Another interesting question that you might want to ask when you do an assessment is, what if the AI that is being proposed to be used in whatever context is helping a particular company or set of company to concentrate power? This is a really a very delicate topic. Again, I have a quote from the German Data Ethics Commission because it's also more general than AI. And he said, the development of, of the data economy is accompanied by economic concentration tendency that allow the emergence of new power imbalances to be observed. Efforts to secure digital sovereignty in the long term are therefore not only a requirement of political foresight, but also an expression of ethical responsibility. Of course, you can follow all kinds of discussion about uh, concentration of power and what it means, you know, and that's also a, a consideration when you are looking at assessment. Another important aspect that we end up discovering that handling intellectual property is key in this situation. You end up, even if you work with a user, the user very likely does not develop the uh, AI system himself, so he might use um, AI being developed by a vendor. And uh, when you are start talking to a vendor or, or producer of technology, the issue of what is IP and how to handle it into an assessment is quite relevant. And also it has consequences on what you can do when you assess some software. There's been some suggestions, for example, um, Google has come up with the paper that is referred here at the bottom, where basically say, well, if you really need to do core reviews, meaning that somebody has to go inside the software and figure it out, the model, the data, how it is trained, how it is tested. In some cases, the code review will be basically impossible because if you are in deep learning, even if you see the code, you might not be able to understand how the function works, but you can actually understand a lot about training. So, and there are issues obviously of intellectual property that are key in, in that respect, besides security and other things. So there is obviously a trade-off here between assessing and preserving IP. It's not new, but it's very important, especially because explicability requires an understanding at least to be able to explain why a certain output has been generated by a specific AI software. So basically we are, um, the focus of our inspection is really on the three pillars of the EU, ethical and societal, technical and legal. Please consider that illegal and unethical are not the same thing obvious, but not for everybody. And legal and ethics always depend on the context. So that means that when you have an assessment, you don't only look at the software, you look at what, what is the context. We call it ecosystems, processes, products, services, people, um, legislation. So th this is all connected. And we come up with a layer model which helps to define what is recommended, what is needed and what is mandatory. So it's a kind of pyramid where here you have the legal and regulatory aspects of whatever context you are assessing that is there. Then this institution, for example, might have a contractual obligation. So these two parts are there anyway. And then all of a sudden you have ethical principle on top that are nice. And then you have this, possibility to do a self-assessment at the moment. And this is all connected. So this is a very simplified view, but obviously you have to take into account this space in order to do a job and, and refer to that. I skipped that because this is really 
the, the things that I mentioned now, and I go to our methodology. This is in a nutshell, the methodology. I cannot disclose all the details because we submitted a journal paper on the detail of the methodology stepwise, so it's under revision, but I can give you an overview. We have basically three phases, a setup phase, an assess phase, and a resolve phase. And then horizontally, we have a so-called protocol. Now, I'm gonna go through each of them in detail, but before I go in detail, let me just explain. Let's assume that you are in charge because you're working for a, an organization that has to make a decision whether, for example, you might want to uh, allow using um, machine learning or, or deep learning in some parts of a hospital for, for example, detecting specific diagnosis like cancer or uh, helping doctors. And somebody has to make a decision and say, okay, is that legal? Is that trustworthy? Uh, what does it mean in terms of, if I use it in terms of my uh, processes and, and situation, what are the risks? So here we are. Now you're left with the checklist and it's not very useful because you know, then you need to start creating a team and that could be internal, it could be external but this really, the assessment is helping you to create a team of experts of different background that are independent. If it's a self-assessment within the company, then you know, I think we can start having a discussion here, but the team has to be uh, formed with in enough skills and, and, and choosing the, the team and the skill is already an ethical, has a an ethical value because this is really the people making the assessment and then decide what you want to assess. Also not easy because the boundary of the assessment might change over time. You might discover something. You might end up even assessing the entire organization. So trustworthy might become an assessment of the organization rather than the software. And then you have a big part, which is called assess. And basically the way we do, <clears throat> we have phases we use social technical scenario that describe the behavior of the AI system, the actors and their expectation, the interaction between the actor, the processes, the technology and the context. And this has been evaluated by a number of experts of different expertise, these people. And the idea is to identify whatever ethical issues and possibly tension you might consider relevant as a consensus building process not an easy one and it could you know generate an iteration there and eventually when you have a list of potential issues we map them to the trustworthy ai categories the seven principle also there is a principle is in principle is easy but then it requires consensus building because the mapping might not be <clears throat> one to one once we had an idea of what you would like to verify, what are the relevant indicators, and then you split the team in small groups of experts, like a due diligence, to execute. And there are several ways of executing. That I, if I have time, I can uh, give uh, some, sharing some uh, lesson we learned. There are several ways to do that. And you keep of iterating until you reach a, an ending point where you generate a list of real issues and possibly tension that need to be resolved. And you give recommendation to relevant stakeholders. We don't solve the problem for them. We give them qualified information. And we have a protocol that starts from the beginning to the very end, which record all we do in a transparent way. So you can actually go backwards and verify decision if this is allowed, because obviously it depends on the context. The protocol disclosed confidential information, then you have already an interesting this, you know, decision to be made. To what extent the assessment is a transparent process that can be then uh, look and evaluated by other stakeholders, for example, uh, user groups or uh, representative of people. So um, in the last uh, 20 minutes, I will give you a little bit more information on 
what we mean with all these steps, but you can find um, a few resources on our website. I have it at the end. As I said, we need to create a team. Not an easy thing because when you create a team, it really depends on the domain and the context. The certain kind of core team, but then depending on the domain, you really need to bring on board experts that they know about the specific domain. And the preconditions are important. The log we discussed uh, is also a political thing because if you force a transparent log, then the question is what is in the log that can be displayed? And actually, if the intellectual property is blocking, then you need to work out by using an approach where the eye is seen as a box and you don't really look at the inside, like how the model is done or how the data was uh, chosen, the data set, the training. You can see the output though. So you can always say, well, the output is like that because the boundary of the inspection is quite relevant. We call it ecosystem. And of course, it's much more than the software. So it's part of society and even general public. Really depends on how you want to use the assessment. The time frame is also quite important. Are we talking about an assessment of one week, three months, the next 10 years? Because if you do next year, it's like monitoring all the time. You are like, uh, and in some cases, you know, there are some uh, analogy with other kind of technology like nuclear technology where you need to really have a long-term view, for example, to dispose the, uh, the nuclear reactive garbage, you know, you're talking about millions of years, you know. So again, this is also a, a choice to be made. Here is one of the tools that we've been using that we found useful, which is uh, using so-called social technical scenario that are either created by experts or are given by the use case. And the team of experts are basically able to iterate and try to understand what are the expectations and what are the implications of this scenario. Again, here is a quote for the uh, German Data Ethics Commission that said, well, it's also important to understand if the context has an implication on the interaction among the actors, and definitely has. So the output of this uh, process is to identify ethical issues. We call it ethical issue because at the beginning, you might not be sure if it's really an ethical issue because not everybody is trained to know what is ethical. You know, a machine learning engineer does not really have a philosophy background necessarily. So we call it flag, whatever we don't know what it is, it could be a technical problem that has We add that, we might actually discover ethical tension. And what is important, and this is the lesson learned, that when different experts are basically listing what they think are ethical issue or even flags, they need to describe it because only by describing it, we reach a consensus. Because if a philosopher talks to a policymaker and talk to a medical doctor and talk to a cardiologist or talk to a machine learning guy, they have all kinds of different terminology and view of the world. So it's important that by describing, we use practical uh, strategy. We give them example of a catalog of tensions. These are, for example, taken from a very interesting paper that was published last year by the Nazi Foundation just to give them an idea of what possible tension there are. Now, some tensions are clear, like for example, accuracy versus fairness. It's clear that if you have a software that is extremely accurate for a certain subset of the population, but is not accurate for some other population, maybe minority or whatever gender or ethnicity, it's not fair. So the tension is, do I use a tool that is extremely good for a minority, but is not fair? Or do I try to have a tool that is fair, 
but then I'm losing accuracy. That's a typical tension that has been studied a lot in machine learning, but it also has a repercussion on, on the domain. Some other difference. So there are, we have a catalog. Experts can refer to that, map it to this catalog, try to define their terminology. It's important that we need to bridge the gap between concepts because some, in some cases, a, a catalog of terms is very important. And this is what, for example, in this paper the, from the Nothing Foundation is called concept building, which I find it quite useful. Is a process, you know, they write it on paper. We did it in practice is really a, a, an issue to put together people with different background. So you clarify ambiguities, you bridge in discipline. And this is all good in, in theory. In practice, what we did we try to arrive to a consensus. And to do that, we map all of this description to the requirements of trustworthy AI or DU. And let me explain you with a little case because I think you then get an idea. One of the case, the first one that we worked was uh, on AI for predicting cardiovascular risk. The problem domain is clear, you know, cardiovascular diseases are number one cause of death globally. So each year and uh, several machine learning techniques have been used for predicting diagnosis, predicting or doing diagnosis. So predicting you have a risk of a heart attack, diagnosis, you have a problem. Uh, uh, and of course, there is also a problem because a lot of uh, this AI is being used without really a clinical test and, and there's very little information. So there are also risks. So the system we assessed was a non-invasive AI medical device that used machine learning to analyze electrical signal of the heart. So it's not invasive, you, you measure electrical signal. Uh, they use a machine learning the software goes in the cloud, analyzes this electrical signal more than a typical ECG, and you come up with a, a number between minus one and one. You can you know, actually visualize it with red. You have a, really a risk of a heart attack. Green, you seems to be fine. Yellow, which is in between, you have a problem, which is unspecified. That's what you get. So, when we look at this case and the expert had to make uh, a description of this, they have to describe, this is an illustration of how ethical issues are mapping to our investigation. So you have an issue with the name, you have a description. When this AI, so this uh, tool is being used in screening asymptomatic people, so people that seems to be doing fine and they are notified with a minor problem. That could be a yellow, for example. Oh, wow. This might impact their life. They might get worried, change their lifestyle after the notification, even though, even though, even though this will not be necessary. So that's a description. Somebody you know described it. So that's good, but what does it mean? Then we map it to the four ethical pillars, for example, respect for human autonomy. Then we agree in the process to map it to some of the seven trustworthy AI requirements. For example, human agency and oversight, human agency and autonomy. But then somebody discovered that you can also map it to these other ethical pillars, prevention of harm. It's not only human autonomy because you, you might do harm to people. Then you map it to Oh, okay, I need to figure it out. Technical robustness, safety, accuracy. See, accuracy, this is the, the key. Ethical tension, there, there, there don't seem to be one. It gives an information where you want to assess. You know, you end up, you know, from this description to here. That's another one. I think it's important to give example because in the example, you have a, an understanding. So another one is if due to this test, more patients with minor cardiovascular problems are being notified and sent to cardiologists. 
Now, when you send to cardiologists, they do an invasive test. It's called angiography. You don't want to do an angiography if you're healthy or you are unsure because it's actually very intense on the people and also costs a lot of money. So this might result in potential harm to the patient and an unnecessary cost for the healthcare system. So again, you see there's a description, there's a map to an ethical pillar, and there's a map to some of the requirements of task work, like for example, societal and environmental well-being, which has some sub-requirements, the impact on society at large, because of course it's too expensive, the society is suffering, and a larger legal and policy implication. Ethical tension, again, could be, here is a case of a real ethical tension between human agency, individual rights, versus social well-being, social welfare. It's a true dilemma, and this has to be presented as such. We cannot solve it, but we had identified. In the previous case, this required, for example, to deep down the assessment and go down to the software to see to what extent this AI is accurate for all kinds of people. Or if not, it's not fair. So these are two examples. I think it's useful to have the example. And then you can choose how to proceed with the assessment. You have several ways of doing it from bottom up to top down. It's a kind of technical. Um, we create layers, so we, we need to start somehow. And we say, okay, where do we start? We start here, or we start here. I mean, depending where you start, then you're all connected. So if you want to assess the whole thing, you can go from here to here, or you can start here, or you can go around. So like in life. And that could be an, a, you know, an, an idea of an ecosystem. You have a software, like in this case, a company, it, the development was in Germany, the marketing was in the United States, and the software was actually on the cloud. And then the tool was basically embedded into a box and used. And then at the end, somebody gets the output. It could be a patient or could be a doctor and say, green, you're good, red, you're not good, yellow, you go and do something. And this is the ecosystem. So you don't assess only this software, you look at the whole thing. A little note. If the ecosystem is geographically distributed, then you have an interesting situation where, for example, this ecosystem where it was designed is in this place. And this where it's used is in some other ecosystem and where the decision are made is here. And I let you the, uh, think of all the political implication of this discussion when you start looking at democracy of these places or, or concentration of power. So then you do an investigation. And if you only look at the software, you don't really get the big picture. So that's why if you check the fridge, but the entire kitchen is unethical, you see, you have an unethical kitchen with the ethical fridge. Then we create so-called path because like a due diligence, you need to indicate people where to inspect. You execute the path, which is quite difficult because it depends what you need to execute. You might need experts in machine learning. They need to figure out what fairness means. And the path is basically the way you can reproduce the inspection by looking at what kind of steps work have been done. I like this. I, I come up with this idea that a path can also be random, like water finds its way, or a path could also look at what is not there, why is not there. Missing parts are really interesting. De develop an evidence base is crucial for any kind of application, especially in healthcare, because that's the only way to support claims. The AI vendor claims that the software is very accurate. What is a claim? The claim has to be validated with medical evidence. This is really one of the key points, which is not easy because it implies to understand who is in right to say, I, I know what is medical evidence, evidence in general, how you define it. And even within the medical domain, we discovered there is a tension between um, doctors that are in the so-called medical evidence, evidence-based medicine. And they think, for example, that a cardiologist would be too close to the field and is biased. You see, it's something we discovered by working with experts. So developing an evidence base 
what is biased, what is not biased, who is the expert that can tell you has a major implication on the entire process because he actually makes the claim either not fulfill or with a clear backup of evidence. Sometimes you simply have to do that and you stop. You don't even have to go to the software because you say, well, this software is totally unrealistic because it has so many risks. There's no evidence and you don't want to take this risk. If you want to take your risk, then you know that you are experimenting. In other cases, you have to go deep down and do all kinds of uh, technical, sometimes uh, verification. I give an example because I think it's quite important. You know, fairness is a typical example in healthcare, for example. When you talk about fairness, what is fair? If you are at the ethical value here or specific in healthcare or in machine learning, we have different words. And so when you are setting the concept of fairness in the trustworthy a, a European approach, you're here, then you have to define what it means fairness in healthcare, and then eventually figure it out how the engineers down there use it in machine learning. And machine learning, you have things like this, they're very technical and they're like uh, Lego bricks to compose numbers. But fairness is not only numbers, you know, of course I can say group fairness or um, individual fairness, if you have a bunch of things. And eventually, even if you have numbers, you have trade-off. So for example, here you see, you start having terminology that unless you know the field, you don't understand because you don't talk about any more fairness. You talk about things like equalize odds versus equal allocation. Each of them is a way to measure fairness with the data and the output, but there's a trade-off. If you have this, you cannot have this one here. If you have this, you can have that one here. If you leave it to engineers, they're overwhelmed. So it requires not only that the machine learning specialists are on board, but they are explaining and translate this language into a language where clinical and ethical experts can actually talk and explain and make a decision. This is really a lesson also taken from uh, this paper, extremely interesting paper that Google did it with the Chicago University uh, Hospital two years ago. And it's quite interesting because I, we find it useful. So uh, I skip that because uh, we go through this process and eventually you might reassess ethical issue and flag given the result of the assessment of the investigation. Some are confirmed, some are new, and some stop is reached. And then basically you can present what you will discover. And basically uh, there's a very interesting uh, catalog of uh, possible trade-off that we find it very useful from this paper and true ethical dilemma. There's nothing we can solve. You need to make a decision, which is a true dilemma in ethical terms. Or the other one is a dilemma in practice because you don't have the resources and the time to really dig into that. Or it was a false dilemma, maybe it's a technical problem, which is still a very important one, but it can be solved. Then you can decide if you are forcing people to give scores, you can give recommendation and you can start maintenance if you want. If you do trade-off, you have basically three possibilities. So it's fine. It's fine, but you need to do some fixing. You need to really redress because it's really impossible if you is already deployed. If it's not deployed, you can say no way to deploy or you have to change. I want to conclude by saying that if you do an assessment, don't expect that people are happy. So it really depends on who wants the assessment. If you want the assessment for marketing reasons, because then you want to then create a brochure and say we're trustworthy, there might be res resistance, you know, because you might end up discovering something that is not good. At the same time, if you are helping the company to do a better job and do uh, a better software, there might be actually less resistance, but it depends on what is the importance of, uh, of that in terms of priority. If you are interested, we have a website that contains a lot of information, also including what Margarita was saying 
is the uh, set of lectures that series that we did last um, uh, first part of the year with a lot of material. And uh, I'd like to thank for your attention. I also like to thank a number of people that in the course of the year did uh, a lot of interesting feedback work for us. And uh, I'm basically finished with my presentation. Thank you. Thank you greatly, Roberto, for this uh, insights, for sharing uh, with us uh, this uh, study. Best wishes for this uh, study, because uh, we really need uh, a contribution and also models that try to measure in some way the, the fairness uh, of uh, an AI system and the ethical uh, part of the AI system. And uh, in particular, uh, you mentioned some examples that are very important in the medicine, cardiology, possibly also with other diseases. Uh, we have uh, some time devoted now to the question, and uh, I invite uh, the audience maybe to put uh, the question in a Q&A section or uh, to raise the end. Uh, at the moment, we have one question by uh, Gerard uh, Santucci. So maybe Gerard, if you want to put your question, I switch on your micro, so now you can speak. Gerard? Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah. Uh, Roberto, hello. How 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 are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well, Gerard. Thank you. Um, nice to see you there. I want to commend the work, the fantastic work you have done to today. Uh, it's immense, and I'm sure each and all of us would have a lot of questions to ask. Um, it's fascinating and inspiring what you what you've said. My my main take will be um, to share it with all with all of you. The attention we have to bear on uh, ter termino terminology, how we define the concepts. Uh, this came all along what you have said, and, and I think it's uh, very, very important. You insisted at the end on the concept of fairness, and indeed it's very hard to to say what it is depending on context, on goals, etc. My my question was of a different kind. Uh, we we had some I had some uh, issues with the connection at some stages, and 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 perhaps I missed something. But there was a slide when you uh, showed that uh, the ethical issues would have to be uh, mapped uh, onto the uh, uh, principles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the four, the four ones, or, or, or perhaps even the, the eight uh, requi requirements that are connected to them. Uh, this is fine. Now, when, when I when I heard that, I had the feeling that uh, we we are in the same box because, after all, if, if I'm not wrong, the issues uh, as we look for them, as we want to uh, pick them up, they are based on uh, principles. So I wonder just if there was not some uh, internal inconsistency with the fact that we define uh, issues in ethics that are based on the, on the principles that I suppose should define them. And then we say we need to map uh, the former against uh, the latter. So oh, I, I just was a bit uneasy, but again, it was perhaps uh, because I was disconnected at some stage. But if, please, you would like to come back to this slide and explain further what you meant. Yes, uh, Gerard, thank you. This is really a good question because I actually put the, I don't know if you see the slide, is a, is a slide with the case study. This is really a, a lesson learned. We started, we know really, a, uh, an, an attitude and we discover that if you leave uh, let's say 10 experts of different kinds like one is a medical doctor with evidence base the other one is a philosopher the other one is uh, somebody that and, and let's let's say let's let's talk about people who have an understanding of ethical issue because when you start having uh, uh, let's say machine learning engineers that have been trained they have no idea so at least most of them. So we actually started by simply say, describe it as you want. And you can imagine that at the end, the description, it was like, you know, for, I'd give an example because we were, uh, at the beginning, somebody wrote asymptomatic 
rather than asymptomatic people, they wrote patients. In screening asymptomatic patient. Okay. Now the interesting thing about that, and immediately somebody that is in evidence base, uh, a patient is by definition somebody who has a symptom. You see, so there was already a process of trying to have a common language. For somebody that is not an expert, a symptomatic uh, patient is the same as asymptomatic people. But for somebody that has spent maybe 25 years of all this work on that is a great difference because then you are distinguishing between people who have a, a precondition and people that have nothing. So that was the first lesson. The second is that if we leave it like that and everybody was saying, okay, how do we do the investigation? Because the investigation here is really about accuracy. But how do you go from here to here? You can go random, but you don't go through any kind of framework. So at the end, after long discussion, we end up saying, okay, we are using the U framework. The U framework has two layers, as the ethical pillars that are important to know because this is really it's about people but they are not really something you can investigate. So basically we say, okay, how do you map it? So you map it here. And then somebody say you map it here. They might not agree. So you need to have a consensus here. Once you have the consensus here, then each of this is mapped into some of the requirements for trustworthy. For example, this two. And again, there might not be that everybody's in agreement, but if they agree that, for example, in order to understand if you are really notifying people correctly, you need to figure out accuracy. Rather than say, oh, I think I need to do fairness, I go through the process and say, okay, this is a part of the requirement, which is called technical robust and safety accuracy. And here, here you have to go down. So a team has to be created of people that understand at the level of the machine learning, it was accurate. I mean, was it functioning properly for all data? And don't go, go up and give a feedback. So anyway, to make it short, we are still learning about that. Now that we have this uh, uh, assessment in this case, with the new cases, we can really verify what is the best way to reach consensus mapping into a framework. And this framework, since I have a, a, um, a dictionary of terms, help everybody to be on the same page. I don't know if you answer your, your question. The question was not an easy one. So I've been trying to give my best answer. Okay, uh, I put a Gerare, you can talk. So just to confirm that uh, the, the answer is great, uh, and uh, I'm only uh, 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 relieved and happy to have confirmation that a lot of further effort must be uh, made in this area. Uh, it is very, very important, and I'm sure that uh, the presentation uh, of uh, Roberto today uh, will uh, raise awareness on that, and hopefully will foster uh, further, further, further research uh, and debates. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We have also a question by Ajay. Uh, Ajay, if you want to put the question live, okay, you can talk. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Hello. Hello, yes. Ajay. Hey Roberto, hi. First of all, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation and giving us an introduction of the gene inspection. <laughs> you are doing such a great job. Uh, I just wanted to ask two questions. Uh, uh, we understood very well the strength of your analytical model and you told us that you have tested your model on several audiological data sets. So just wanted to ask question like, what was the size of your data sets on which you tested your model? And what are, the, what are the limitations of your model? And how you are planning to deal with the limitations of your model in the near future? So I think there are two questions. So I think you're referring to the use case that we have uh, assessed, yes. not yes, the yes. new one, right? So right. That's, that's a very interesting question. So 
in uh, in that particular case, they uh, they use a uh, well. I can go a bit technical, but they have a a, a weak classifier. So it's like a, a an ensemble of classifier. That's their model, mm -hmm. which is basically was trained with the small data sets of six hundred and fifty patients. So not very big. Mm -hmm. um, roughly 300 and something male and, mm -hmm. and, and a bit less on female. And all of these patients were uh, actually uh, from hospital in free location in one area. So, and uh, th that actually caused a lot of, of issue because number one, the, the data set was not very big. Uh, number two, the data sets was actually coming from an area uh, very specifically geographically. And uh, since we didn't know the, the patient information because of, of data protection, so we didn't know anything about ethnicity. We didn't know anything about habits. So now you can imagine that this tool is supposed to uh, predict the risk of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But now you're using it, okay? And um, and uh, or let's say my assumption, but it's also assumption that's important. The assumption that I informally had was is likely is likely that the majority of the people where the data was coming from were Caucasian. They might be wrong, but let's assume that's the true. If that's the case, then the AI was trained using, as example, Caucasian. Now, the tool has been sold in other parts of the world. Now, the question was, is it accurate? You see, now we are talking about accuracy. That's exactly here. So you go from here to here, straight to IP, because in order to answer this question, you have to have a non-disclosure. Otherwise, you don't get the information on the data sets. You don't know the, the model. So we did sign a, an NDA, but that basically means you cannot disclose the information. So you see, that's actually the paradox. Then you have to work on another approach and say, oh, I take it as a black box, and I look at the medical evidence. And the medical evidence is a big, process because the company has an interest. So I will say, yes, uh, it, it's fine. Ethical signals are the same for everybody, but the heart is not the same for ethnicity. So you see, that's a, it, it's actually known. Now, the question would be then, is a tool that is using electrical signal, not the position of the heart, not the size of the heart, accurate for any ethnicity? or not, and there was no evidence. So we couldn't find any evidence, but we could also not find a counter evidence. See, these are the things that you have here. And then if you feedback to this, and you stated that this still is a risk, because you know, at least from our best practice, we cannot guarantee prevention of harm. I don't know if you answered your question, okay, but yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for giving the answer to my question. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, have you up uploaded the technical description of your model on your website or any uh, paper that you recently published based on this model? Hey, Roberto, a chapter in a book. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, not really in the chapter in the book. <laughs> not really, not, not really. No, no. unfortunately, uh, Ajay, you, you made the point. It would be amazing to be able to uh, show that, but it's under an IP. So you see, that, that's, that's actually the interesting thing that, so, and also there's an also an interesting thing I didn't mention that if you do a mistake in your assessment, you might uh, uh, actually endanger the company. Mm. Yeah, mm. This is a startup. So if the startup gets like a, a publicity, oh wow, they're, they're, they're doing harm mm. and it's not sustained. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You see, that's attention. That there's really yeah. attention um, on that. So, because which is all. This is an early stage project. So yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. That's why you are not. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's open to other question in the audience. I see uh, a question from yes. Zelun Wang. Zelun Wang. So Zelun, do you want to put a question live? So I. 
I switch on your micro in this case. Uh, Zelun, okay. You can talk, Zelun. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Yes, I'm, uh, I want to ask a question uh, that's not that much related to the topic because I noticed that when we talk about ethical issues, the, there could be very huge different understanding between different cultures. Like for example, in China, there might be no such ethical issue, but uh, uh, in the Western world, it could be huge. But uh, for now, the Chinese companies, many of Chinese companies are playing a more and more important role in the machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence services. And uh, many of them has, you know, a lot of users uh, data with, well, identical ethical issues. Did you find that could be a problem talking to those people from a different culture about, you know, ethics in artificial intelligence? Um, thank you, Delon. This is a big question. This is not, this is really, you, I mean, you're addressing a, a global issue. So if you look at the world and if you look at all the different cultures, um, then it's extremely difficult to come up with a, uh, a common set of principles. I think the OECD is trying to do that. To my knowledge, they've been um, the, the first one to try to define a common or set of principles that can be acceptable on, pa on paper by a variety of, of countries. And, and cultural differences are huge. So um, you, you're quite right, you know, there's a, a completely different concept of fairness and society individual. Ultimately, what we've done, and um, I can only answer your question, is we've been rooted our work on what the European Commission has done, because we need to start with something that has some foundation. And then it's basically rooted into uh, fundamental rights and democracy. So now it's up to the stakeholders to make a qualified decision when, for example, a, uh, a AI developed in a country that is not necessarily into the same kind of uh, cultural, political, um, sociological background, what they want to do with that. That's why we have this question up front in the assessment because the European Commission in their uh, checklist, they recommend also to do a uh, screening of fundamental rights. Now, this is what the European Commission has recommended. And obviously one can argue that sometimes some software has nothing to do with that. In other cases, it might. So uh, it would be extremely interesting, but for the moment, we're not working on that, to expand our experience and expose ourselves to a different um, uh, perspective. That's why we have in our advisory board, a, uh, somebody from the OCED, because then eventually maybe we might exactly address this issue that you are posing, which is a global issue. So we're certainly not able to solve it ourselves, but it's a big issue and very practical because at the end of the day, you know, most of the AI will come from different places most of it not from Europe, that's the reality. And we need to make decisions also here in Europe on what to do with that. So that's why the EU is important to follow because they might come up with regulation. So I don't know if you answer your question, but there's a big, big, uh, I mean, Margarita, that's a big debate. It could be Definitely. an entire series for, for the next one. Because this Definitely. Is you. Exactly, exactly. No, thanks. Uh, there is another question by Rupesh, Rupesh Kumar. So, I, okay, you can talk, uh, Rupesh. Hello, Robert. Thank you very much for your presentation. And also, I followed last week as well, Tedric, as well. It's very informative. I've only recently started to follow the image research ever since I joined in Lyon. So, just the question today I had for you is um, as you briefly mentioned about the uh, the, the European Commission of High Level Expert who created the guidelines for the AI. And as you see, there is like three points that are very interesting in terms of understanding like the framework. And the first is about being lawful, that ethical and robust, right? 
-hmm. So the ethical part where I'm having a bit difficulty is that uh, when you sign a non-disclosure with some company that you might work with, and if you found out something that is not the nice way, you know, I mean, a great outcome, because as you said that, if you found out somebody is going to have some cardiovascular disease and you know how to prevent it in early stages, it might again create like a, like a domino effect, right? Like it has to go through like insurance company have to pay. It's like all linked in, in some way, but I'm not sure how to explain it in a, I mean, I don't do the research, so I kind of explain it in my way. So how would you feel like it's, there's a way that it's kind of, you have to cross a little bit of the ethics, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it was understood. No, no, thank you, Rupesh. I mean, the question is really great because, uh, um, see, first of all, as you correctly said, there are these three pillars here, lawful, ethical, and robust. Um, now, in order to do the third, this one here, very likely, if you need to handle intellectual property, you have two possibilities. Number one, it really depends who has requested the assessment. That's the key. If it's a company requested assessment, which means it's a self-assessment, one has to make in clear upfront that if you do an assessment, you might discover something. Yeah. Now, the question is, how do we agree if this is something you publish or you keep it private for the company? So this is the key in and and self assessment within company. I have the feeling if you if you consider big banks or other large organization, they do their self assessment, but they do not disclose it to the public. Hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully, and that actually is your question. Hopefully, they do have an ethical committee internal that is. In the, in the position to say internally, we think that this is not really very good. You might want to change it or you might not want to use it. Um, if, he, if he's external, then he gets an audit. And when an audit is in place, either it's by law, so they are forced to do it or um, so, but even with a startup, you know, it's same problem. So if you work with a startup, if you do have any any interest with the startup, you cannot do the assessment with them because then you might eventually end up to the point where you discover something that is, as you said, not nice, but you no. cannot publish because if you publish it, then the company might have a problem. So I think that's why we have this set of questions up front because it's to clarify what game are we playing here. Yeah, at, at some point, like the, I, I mean, I understand what you meant, like at some point as well, you know, like if you work with a big company and still you found out something bad and still it's always the case that they have the authority over the decision outcome. I mean, I know it cannot be published because you signed a non-disclosure, but at the same time, it's something that we are missing in terms of the ethical, I mean, I don't, the overall big picture, you know. Yeah, correct. And that's why I think Margarita, you know, the issue of intellectual property, which is fitting very well at business school and, and ethics is so important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's much more than AI, but in this case, since you know one of the principles is explainability, so and they added on purpose. So in the in the normal ethics you have the free, but now they added this explicability. How do you explain something you don't see? Exactly. That's the yeah. question. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, true. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Roberto. Uh, other question? Hello, Roberto. Hello, uh, Frederica, yeah. please. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so I have a, a naive question uh, for you. So I really enjoyed the talk, so thank, thank you about it. Um, so it seems to me that your, your approach mostly ap applied to uh, what I would describe as this uh, um, prediction machines, right? So like that refers to those black boxes, right? These black, black box issues. So I wonder if you could extend this approach to um, to other other type of algorithm, more more predictive and or or, or more more innovative, such as uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, projects, or, or more, if I even go further, so so I'm quite familiar with the blockchain uh, mm. uh, ecosystem, and that's a different, that's kind of a different 
uh, word in the sense that then you have explicability. So if you look at smart contracts, you do know exactly how the argument, algorithm uh, runs, but no one has any control over it, right? So, and, and that can obviously lead to important ethical issues. So I wonder if, uh, generally speaking, if, if you could extend your approach to this kind of program. Thank you, Frederick. I like the question. First of all, I have to say that I am very little knowledgeable about blockchain. I really know the basic, very basic. But the interesting thing is that I have discovered that a couple of experts, they even mentioned that they see a, a connection between explicability in the terms of control of blockchain and, and some of the ethical issue here. So I think it, I cannot comment whether this process can be extended to IoT or blockchain as a domain. I think if somebody mentioned that they can see blockchain being used for validating certain things like with contract, but I'm not an expert, so I uh, we only been working on healthcare. I think it would be an amazing area of research if somebody of you would say, "Oh, I'm interested. I'm an expert in blockchain. We would like to cooperate, and then we can do some spin-off." But you know, we need experts or so people like you. And then uh, because I already received it two or three times this connection. But since I don't know enough about blockchain and I don't even have any use case at hand, we focus on what we understand. Actually, even in healthcare, you know, say understand is actually we're learning. So that's where we are. But I think it's a very good, uh, um, again, to Margarita, that could be another very interesting area. And, say, and I, I could say, Robert, uh, Frederica is a part of the research center on artificial yeah, I, intelligence. I, I, I saw the face. I think you did the presentation the first. Right? <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I saw in the presentation. Oh, that's the Frederick. <laughs> so uh, this could be, uh, yes, uh, and this could be also an area of uh, synergy and uh, collaboration in Absolutely. the next future. So yeah. Frederick, take note. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Roberto. So last uh, question, if uh, any. Uh, I see connected also some students from the Master of Science in Digital Marketing Data Science because we covered also the ethical issue in artificial intelligence. And so, uh, because when we consider ethics uh, in artificial intelligence, we are talking about human-centric artificial intelligence uh, that is uh, more and more important. Uh, so, Roberto, which is your uh, suggestion that you give uh, in terms of uh, open issue when we consider human-centric artificial intelligence? I mean, uh, when there is an ethical component inside the AI system, a strong ethical component. Very difficult question because it's very open. So. I think it is important that number one, in university, we can do our part by um, teaching at various level how to include practical ethics or apply ethics. That's very important. We're not talking about a discussion about high level ethics, you know, basically a basic understanding of what is apply ethics. It's just really, it, it, it's, uh, it's very important to distinguish what ethics and what is legal, what is a relationship, what is a moral value, and then somehow try to embed it into an horizontal study course. I think it's important it's all, so that it becomes uh, an horizontal information that can be take into account by several people. In marketing is clear. So if you're doing marketing and you're doing a study and behavioral study, you might want to include in your uh, experiments. Also, how do you take into account maybe the, the requirements of the EU? You know, they have the four principle, which are very difficult to quantify, but then you can try to see, for example, is my, um, um, that's a particular activity, sustaining well-being, or is somehow using something that might end up harming people, or discriminating something, or giving a, a, an a unfair advantage to others. That would be something that you can immediately include into their own study. And of course, he has to do, and then when you go out, and you are, let's say, the professional, then you've been trained, and you can mention it. Because at the moment you get out of university and besides, you know, in business and in medicine where, you know, ethics is like, a, you know, compulsory, 
I didn't see in any other place. So then you had to understand what is the culture of the company you work with, mm -hmm. what is the mm -hmm. management, is a man also mm -hmm. management should be really involved. It would be good to do a series of uh, panel with key stakeholders and say, oh, okay, how, what can we do for? Yeah, that's the, the reason also of this seminar uh, is yeah. uh, to start the reflection around ethics. Uh, but I go a, a step uh, more deep. Uh, if I ask you which are the skills uh, that uh, the new generation of managers have to acquire to integrate uh, this uh, ethical sensibility, I would say, when they study AI system, uh, which I are the it, two. Yeah, I think they should have a basic of applied ethics that I'm an engineer. So certainly I didn't learn in school. I didn't learn in, 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 in my research. I only learned it by just doing this work. Mm. Because you know when I started to do data ethics some, some years ago with, with a lawyer, by the way, so a professor of law, I end up discovering, okay, these are the ethical principle. But I didn't really, I wasn't really part of this discussion because this is not my area. I'm a data engineer, right? And then for me to learn and, and have a, a basic, basic understanding of what is an ethical value, what is a moral value, what is ethics and what is actually legal, what is technical. And, and um, I think it's important because then you have a basic without getting to a higher level and then link it to example. If you have no example, I think you stay in, into this abstract way and you end up, but this is me. I, and as you see, we are bottom up practitioner, right? But that's the only way to learn from me. Unless Thank you. You know, somebody comes from the top and say, you should do that. So you can do a lot of stuff in your school. I think that we could do some experiments. I'd be happy to be involved. Thanks, eh? I keep note, uh, then oh, yeah. uh, I will uh, solicit you it's for even this. Record, so. <laughs> Good. Uh, so it is uh, 1.30, so we are pretty close to the end of our seminar. We are perfectly in time. So if there are no other questions on the audience side, uh, we thank you greatly for your time, Roberto, for uh, uh, sharing uh, also your study and uh, your uh, insights about the role of ethics uh, in our discipline. I wanted to highlight the fact that um, Roberto Zicari is professor in uh, information system. So you are, in, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in database. So a different uh, angle of view of management, uh, more focused on data, on information system. And that's the goal of what we are looking for also in these debate, the, in debates, in these uh, seminaries, uh, to have a different uh, point of view, different uh, angle uh, to analyze management, uh, how AI system are impacting management. And thank you for the invitation. It was really nice. And thank you for attending it. Our pleasure. So we share this uh, video on the website uh, and uh, I invite also those interested to give a look uh, to the previous website because we cover several topics and every seminar has been uh, recorded. And, and then uh, starting from the seminar, we are also in the progress uh, to edit uh, the book that uh, put together the different contribution from the main, uh, most interesting uh, topics. So thanks again, Roberto, for your collaboration, but let's keep in touch for a further collaboration in the blockchain, maybe on the ethics with experiments or something else that you are free to propose us. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. You too. Thanks. thanks. And uh, thanks to everybody for attending this seminar. And uh, the next one will be in November. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Roberto. Bye. Thanks.